Feelings of anxiety, uncertainty, and powerlessness are widespread during a pandemic. They also happen to be the kinds of emotions that drive people into believing in conspiracy theories, according to our next guest. He is Joseph Yuzinski, an associate professor of political science at the University of Miami and author of Conspiracy Theories, a primer. And he joins us now from Miami in the Sunshine State, which is a wonderful place to be right now. I know you can't get outside too much, but your 80 degrees has got to be better than our zero Celsius here. Come on, admit it. So I grew up in the cold weather, so uh, up in the north. Uh, so I will take this over there any day. Uh, of course, <laughs> it would be better if I could go outside more, but uh, I, I, I am not unhappy. <laughs> Uh, God willing, that day will come soon enough. You have written that COVID-19 has created the kind of perfect storm for conspiracy theorists. How come? So if I wanted to do a laboratory experiment where I took people into a room and tried to do things to them to get them to believe in conspiracy theories, I couldn't do better than what nature is doing right now. So everyone is focusing on the same thing at the same time, and they are facing economic uncertainty, they're afraid of a, of a virus that could potentially kill them. And there are uh, feelings of powerlessness and a lack of control that has taken over everyone everywhere in the entire world right now. So um, psychologists who do experiments with these sorts of things could not do it better than what uh, Mother Nature has done here. Well, follow up on that. Psychologically, what do conspiracy theories offer people? So what they offer is a way to understand things that we don't fully understand on our own. Now, it's sort of strange in the sense that we could reach for an explanation like, I don't fully understand COVID-19, and perhaps a conspiracy theory might help us understand it better, like it escaped from a Chinese laboratory, or maybe some nefarious group released it to kill us all. Uh, the problem is that it might give us some sense of certainty over an explanation but most people aren't going to sleep better at night knowing that there's some powerful group out there that wants to kill them well the allegation that this virus was somehow developed in a lab in china is i mean there's no proof for that there's no evidence of that it is quote unquote out there but that's mm. not the wackiest uh, conspiracy theory i've heard i won't share mine but uh, you want to share one of yours so there are a lot of wacky ones out there perhaps the strangest i've heard is that uh, that the authorities knew about it for decades because uh, Dean Koontz, the, the uh, mystery novelist, mm -hmm. wrote about it in a, in a book that came out 40 years ago. And in that, there's a, uh, a virus that gets released and starts killing people called the Wuhan 400. So people took this to mean that somehow, uh, you know, the government, speaking through Dean Koontz, knew about this, and now it just finally escaped. Uh, but there's no evidence for that at all. And in fact, what Dean Koontz was writing about is very different than this particular coronavirus now. Uh, true or false, uh, Anthony Fauci uh, essentially wants everybody to get this virus because he's got the patent on the vaccine coming down the way and stands to make a billion dollars once we all have to get inoculated. You know, what's interesting is that these conspiracies seem new and wacky and out there. But they're the same things that we've heard over and over again uh, for my entire lifetime. So th the only thing that really changes is the, is the nouns and the names. So people thought that the bird flu was some sort of uh, pharmaceutical company scam. They thought AIDS was a trick to, to kill off parts of the population that rich people didn't like. Um, all of these things have been out there. And the idea that pharmaceutical companies or doctors want to get rich off of making us sick and then selling us fake cures has been around uh, for time immortal. Um, so there's nothing new. It's just people are applying these old ideas to this new situation. Well, the one I just mentioned came from a, I, I, I use this term advisedly, a documentary that is now making its ways on social media called Plandemic. And it's got a number of... Uh, completely unverifiable claims that are made in, in Plandemic. Um, but I want to know how belief in the Plandemic offers relief to the anxiety of those who tend to want to believe that stuff. How does that work? Because they're, they're latching on to something that tells them what they want to believe. They're latching on to something that, that matches their existing worldview. 
And it, it's important to these people to do that right now because of the anxiety and the uncertainty that they're facing around this. So it's, it's serving as sort of a, a solve uh, for, uh, for the injuries that, that this pandemic is causing. And it doesn't necessarily occur to them uh, because what these videos are saying matches some of the ideas they already have, it doesn't occur to them to think about, gee, are any of these ideas really rational? So in that video, for example, there are claims like, you know, walking around on the beach sand is going to cure you of a, you know, a, a disease. And, and that stuff is just nonsense. And, and nobody would believe that um, if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, those are really extreme ideas to latch on to. I wonder if part of the appeal uh, for conspiracy theories as well is the notion that there's usually something, you know, kind of clever slash sinister slash intellectually based that suggests that I get this. I have done the mental gymnastics and I understand this and you poor sod, you don't. Therefore, I'm smart. Is that part of the equation? Sure. For some people, there is a desire to feel unique. And conspiracy theories can offer that because if you're adopting uh, fringe ideas that are outside the mainstream, you could say, well, you know, I know the inside dope. I know what's really going on. And everyone else is, is a sucker or, you know, what they might call the sheeple. Um, but, mm -hmm. but they don't know what's really taking place. And I do. And, they, and that can make people feel good about themselves um, adopting this, whether it's true or not. Now, you're from New Hampshire originally, so you know where the province of Quebec is, and I'm about to cite some research from a university in Quebec, <laughs> the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, this is some preliminary re uh, results from research done there. 38% apparently of Canadian respondents believe their government is hiding important information about the coronavirus. This is Canadians. A third said they believe COVID-19 was created in a lab. We talked about that one already. 15% of respondents believe that the pharmaceutical industry is involved in the spread of the coronavirus. And just over 10% linked the virus with the 5G wireless network technology. Now, those aren't fringe numbers. Those are actually fairly sizable numbers of people who have access, allegedly, to you know, reputable sources of information on a timely, regular basis. Uh, do those numbers worry you? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I guess the good news is they could be higher. And in the United States, those numbers are very similar. So we get about 29% uh, believing that the virus is being exaggerated to hurt President Trump and 31% thinking that it was created and spread on purpose. Uh, so we, again, between the US and Canada, about a third um, buying into those ideas. Um, you would think that those numbers would be higher given that everyone is paying attention to this everyone has their their focus on this one particular thing and that this virus has caused so much uncertainty and upheaval in people's lives on the other hand um, there seem to be some natural barriers to people believing in conspiracy theories where some people just aren't going to buy in and it's going to take a lot of evidence for you know to really convince some people and in this case um, it's going to take a lot more evidence to convince, you know, 60 or 70 percent of the population of these ideas. Is there a particular demographic or group that tends to want to buy into conspiracy theories more than others? Well, you would think. I mean, when I ask people, do you, you know, imagine that prototypical conspiracy theorist. And if they close their eyes, they'll imagine a, a middle-aged white guy with slightly conservative views, uh, somebody who looks like me perhaps from New Hampshire probably, and they'll say, that's the guy, he's living in his mother's basement with a ham radio and a tinfoil hat. Um, but the polls tell a very different story. And it, it, what we find is that men and women are equal, conspiracy theories are believed across different races and across political parties equally too. And people are often surprised to hear that, but everyone can fall victim uh, from time to time and no matter what group um, they belong to. I guess the one thing that's that particularly troubling about it is that these these groups of people tend to be absolutely impervious to empirically provable facts. But l let's take a run at this anyway, Professor. Why don't you, let, let's assume somebody watching this right now 
uh, believes one of the conspiracy theories that we've talked about already. What would you say to them to try to convince them of the error of their ways? Um, well, there is no silver bullet to get someone to change their mind, especially if they have their feet dug in. Um, so for those people, I, you know, wish them a good day and, you know, uh, send them along because there isn't going to be much to discuss. Uh, but for people who aren't sure or who are open to negotiation and evidence, then maybe the first question I would ask is, you know, what is your source for this? And that will do two things. It will, one, tell them that sources are important. It would make them think about where they're getting their information from. And it might cause them to have to say out loud um, and sort of take stock of where they got this information from. So if they have to say, well, I got this uh, conspiracy theory from uh, conservativeeaglenewspunch.com, um, it might ring to them in their mind that maybe that's not the best source of news and perhaps they only bought into it because it made them feel good or it matched what they already believe, but um, it's not the best source of information. Can I assume that saying to them, how can you be so stupid is not a good approach to take? No, because on, on the one hand, it, it might say more about you to them. So they'll be thinking, well, I know the inside dope, and it only shows how brainwashed this guy is. Hmm. Now, early in this pandemic, President Trump did refer to the virus as the Democrats, quote unquote, new hoax. How does one combat conspiracy theories when the president of the United States, from time to time, seems to be lending so much credence to them? Uh, well, from time to time is uh, oftentimes uh, down here. This is a, a common rhetorical tool that the president uses, um, and it certainly did not help matters that he started off saying that this was the Democrats' new hoax. Um, that certainly gave rise to a lot of Republicans, particularly people who really like Trump and pay attention to politics. Um, it gave rise to them believing that. And it's those same people who now are taking part in protests, um, who aren't engaging in social distancing measures or washing their hands. So it's very dangerous rhetoric. And even though he's sort of changed his tune a little bit, he hasn't fully disavowed those ideas. Um, you know, it's difficult to refute things when the president of the United States says them. He's got the bully pulpit. From your vantage point, more Republicans or more Democrats who buy into conspiracy theories? Equal. And uh, each side likes to think that they're the rational ones, and it's the other side that, that's uh, believing in all the kooky stuff. But uh, when we do polls, um, what we find is both are equally likely to buy in. It's just they're going to believe in different conspiracy theories. And by that, I mean they like to believe in theories that point the finger at the other side. Huh. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Let me follow up on that. A, a, a happy... A conspiracy theory for a Democrat would be different from a from one for a Republican, because how how would they be different? So, for example, uh, Republicans will buy into ideas about Obama faking his birth certificate. So Democrats aren't going to believe that because they like Obama, hmm. whereas uh, Democrats might buy into rhetoric such as the one percent controls everything, um, or Bush blew up the twin towers. Um, so those are things that are more popular on, on their side than on the Republican side. It is interesting. Before you and I were born, Dwight D. Eisenhower left office complaining of a military industrial complex, which under, you know, as it happened, as it turned out, he was right. But, uh, you know, you could also say that those you could accuse him of sort of engaging in this kind of conspiracy theory talk that that you and I are discussing right now. Is there a fine line sometimes between conspiracy theory and something that in the fullness of time turns out to be true? Absolutely. And, and some conspiracy theories will turn out to be true. I mean, Woodward and Bernstein were hunting down a conspiracy theory um, until they found out um, that Richard Nixon and his administration really did violate the Constitution in many, many ways and did conspire to cover up those crimes. Um, so I don't use the term conspiracy theory to mean false, um, but I would use it to mean not yet proven true. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess one of the biggest differences between what was going on in 1972 to 74 with Watergate and Nixon and Woodward and Bernstein and today is that there was no Fox News back then and there was no social mm -hmm. media back then. Can you talk about how those two significant institutions 
have changed the whole state of play today? So uh, the interesting thing is that cable news is catering to, um, at least at least in my country, to uh, partisanship. So they're going to give their audiences what they want to hear. So if you flip back and forth like I do from time to time, it's as if you're going from from one dimension of being to a completely different dimension. Um, you're, you're in different universes. And that can give rise to people believing in conspiracy theories because those cable channels, including Fox, are often teetering on the edge of, of just pushing those ideas blatantly. Um, but I do want to bring a little bit of caution here. Um, in, in the 1960s, when Kennedy was, was assassinated, it only took a few years for 80% of Americans to buy into a conspiracy theory surrounding the assassination. And there was no internet needed for that. There was no Facebook or Twitter needed for that. So people can do this on their own. Um, so oftentimes when we're trying to blame conspiracy theories on the new thing, we're just trying to blame the new technology for what is really an old human problem. Oh, that's a great point. Let's finish up on this, Professor. You've been researching conspiracy theories for many years now. Do you think we're entering a kind of a new phase of conspiracy theories? It's hard to tell. Um, you know, we, we, if you read back in the newspapers over the last few decades, many journalists always think we're entering into the new age or the golden age or, or this is the apex of conspiracy theorizing. Uh, I tend to think that there's more continuity than there is change. I mean, many of the theories that we're talking about now regarding COVID-19, you just change one or two words and that conspiracy theory was popular last year or a few years ago um, with the last disease. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, conspiracy theorists just aren't that creative and there's really nothing new under the sun. <laughs> That is true. Ain't that the truth? Well, it's good of you to join us uh, on TVO tonight. You were certainly new under our sun, and we're grateful that you could spare some time for us. Well, thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you.